Who wants to go to heaven? Honestly. You know, as uh, believers of Jesus Christ, thank you. As believers of Jesus Christ, we know the gospel message. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Well, you know, we know the gospel message, but Satan knows the gospel message also. And the gospel message can be either perverted so that way Satan can have his way and stop people from going to heaven by perverting the gospel message or by attacking the gospel message that is in your heart that is the true gospel message. Now, this week has been a really difficult week for me. I was joking earlier about the Astros, you know, but this week has really been difficult. You know, actually this, past, this year has been the most difficult year in my 47 years of living on this earth. This has been the most difficult year for me and, and for my wife and I, for our marriage. And for, for a lot of things, you know, sometimes you, you, it's God ordained for you to go through trials and tribulations, and sometimes you bring mess on yourself. And at the end of the day, you know, God is a forgiving God. God will forgive you, but you still have to live with the mess that you make. And so where is that leave God's people on this earth? We, we know we're on our way to heaven. Sometimes we just don't want to live. Sometimes we just don't want to, uh, we just don't want to, uh, we, we just, is this all life is, Lord? You know, I mean, I, you know, it's some, for some of us, when we become a Christian, it be, life gets worse. You just ask the, the, the Christians in the Middle East, in Asia. Life gets worse for them. They lose family members because they became a Christian. You know, in America, the gospel message is so perverted because it's self-centered. It's about you, but what God can do for you, 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 you. And that's why there's not such a strong fellowship of churches in America because the gospel message is, is centered on you. It's, it's not the true biblical message. Uh, Friday night, I was, I was listening to Pastor Eric speak in the back, and and I was looking at, you know, what God has blessed, not just this church, so many churches, you know. Um, so many pastors have been under attack this year, more, now more than ever. I, I, I read about one pastor this year killed himself, a very high-profile pastor who dealt with uh, suicidal depression uh, issues in his ministry. He dealt with those types of people. He, he talked about, about depression in the church, and he was, not so to speak, an expert for 15, 20 years as a pastor, and he dealt with these things. And then um, at the end of the day, he killed himself, left his wife and kids in his ministry. Uh, another pastor who, um, who um, had a ministry for, 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 for standing for, 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 for issues that the Bible talked about in regards to uh, homosexuality, you know, he ended up leaving his family, becoming a full-blown homosexual, leaving the church. Another one... Um, actually several of them just leaving Jesus altogether. This year alone, pastors, this year alone. Um, and, and it's like Jesus is coming very soon. You know, the word says, strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. And what that means is, is Jesus was, is the ultimate shepherd. He's the chief shepherd. And it was talking about when when Jesus would be stricken, arrested, and persecuted, his disciples would scatter. They did. But that's a continuing thing that happens in the church today. When a pastor falls, when a pastor fails, um, the sheep scatter. They go here and there. Does that give people an excuse in the church? No, it doesn't. We must remain steadfast on where God planted you, where God placed you. Because at the end of the day, it's you and you alone that stands before the, the throne of God and gives an account of your life. You know, we're either going, you know, we're either going to get it right or we're going to get it wrong. That's it. You're going to make mistakes along the way. You're going to make terrible mistakes. That, that's, that's the fact of life. 
whether you're a Christian or not. But as I was sitting back there Friday night, you know, again, I thank God because Ann and I are coming out of a very, very hard place. And, and I don't need to go into the details about what we've been through here. Some people know, some people don't. And I'm not trying to hide anything. But, but here's what I, what I do know. Somebody, if I wanted to know what war is all about, I'm going to go talk to a soldier who's been in war. Not a textbook soldier. Doesn't give Christians a right to dabble and, or, or do anything wrong. But you know, our eyes are on people and they should be on Jesus. Men will fail, but Jesus will never fail. The devil has been trying to close these doors since they opened back in the early 70s. One church, he, he closed down one church here already once. And the drama that they all went through, I know, they told me. It was hard. And this ministry in this building is no different because it's all God's church, regardless of what name the church was. Or It's all God's church. And the devil has been trying and trying, but, you know, will the saints keep persevering? That means you. That means me. Well, we keep persevering. And so I was sitting back there Friday night, and I, I took a video of, of Eric. You know, there was just a handful of people there, you know. So much depression, so much loss, darkness, chaos in the world in this town of Alvin, but yet the churches are so empty. It's a gospel message that we're preaching, but are we living? Today I'm living it. I haven't always lived it. I've gotten it right at times in my life, and I've gotten it dead wrong at times in my life. You know, I look and I, I just hear the voice of the Lord in my heart. Where are my people? Where are my people? And as soon as I, I, I subscribe to, a, to, a, to a, a little organization that talks to pastors about real issues. And this is from Tyler Green. It was posted on June 18, 2019. And uh, it was so funny because it came up on my phone as I was thinking about all this. And I read it and I'm like, wow. This is a blog from the summertime. And, and I want to read this to you, so please bear with me, because this speaks to the church today. We're, we're, you know, it's called, You Need to Be Inconvenienced for Your Church. Now, now I, I, we have a small group of people in this church that are very faithful. And I say small group, I'm a little over 20. They're very faithful. They are here for everything. Because they have... A passionate relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, Michael, just because I'm not there all the time, you say I don't have a relationship with Christ? Well, let's read this article from another pastor. 1 John 3, 16, he says, so just bear with me for a moment. It says, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. 1 John 3, 16. Tyler Green goes on to say, I once read about a revival which took place among some of Scotland's rural churches in the 1800s. Many of the believers who belonged to these churches lived in the middle of nowhere and would travel long distances for gathered worship. Bear in mind, this was before the emergence of automotive technology. What's more, the revival came during winter months, which made the commute treacherous due to weather conditions, especially since the mountainous terrain was not ideal for travel. Needless to say, meaningful participation in the life of the local church was not easy for these believers. Nevertheless, they were faithful, and God visited them in a powerful way, as one minister from that time noted. It was often a stirring sight to witness the multitudes assembling there in the dark winter evenings to trace their progress as they came in all directions across moors and mountains by the blazing torches which they carried to light to light their way to the places of meeting. The word of the Lord was precious in those days. 
and personal inconvenience was little thought of when the hungering soul sought to be satisfied. As we look to the example of these believers, let's make one crucial observation. Those who are hungry for Christ consider it their joy to be inconvenienced for the sake of his church. Unfortunately, this is in stark contrast to the way many people treat the church today. Countless multitudes attend church regularly, but view it as a commodity, a conveniently located provider of spiritual goods and services for which they make no real sacrifice. Of course, such a perspective can be manifested in different forms. In some cases, it assumes the form of total avoidance of any sort of participation beyond semi-regular attendance on Sundays. However, in many other cases, it is far less obvious than that. Most of us don't mind some level of participation. We have no qualms about signing up to serve for an hour on Sunday or joining a small group. In, in such cases, the problem isn't one of whether we're participating in the mission of the church. It is one of how we're participating. Is advantages? Overscheduled Americans, our participation is often subject to our convenience. Far too seldom, it is something for which we readily adjust our schedules or re envision how we live. Instead, we settle for being involved enough to feel like we've done our due diligence before God, but without any disruption of our everyday lives. Or, to put it more plainly, we've resorted to negotiating our participation in the church's mission when we should be completely surrendering to it. God isn't after the win-win. He's after our full devotion. Let's boil this down so we can see what's really at stake. Our aversion to being inconvenienced for the local church reveals our lack of hunger for Jesus. For those who hunger for him, above all else, will joyfully love what he loves and value what he values, no matter the cost. Or as the apostle John put it, those whose hearts have been apprehended by the love of Jesus lay down their lives for their brethren. That's in 1 John 3.16. Therefore, when it comes to life in the local church, we have two choices before us. We can have convenience or we can have more of Jesus. We must decide. We can't have both. So for you, which will it be? As you consider that question, read this insight from Ray Ortland. Quote, If your relationship with your church is ambiguous and sporadic and subject to convenience, the problem is not your relationship with your church. The problem is your relationship with Jesus Christ. He has made his loyalty clear. He even delights in his church. He is committed to the revival of the world through the revival of the church. To God, the most important thing in all of created reality is his church. A crown of beauty in his hand. Your own greatness your own greatest happiness is the revival of your church, unquote. Tyler Green goes on to say, want to experience true happiness in Christ? Do you want to? If so, your local church must feel like an inconvenience. Its mission must cost you something. God is calling us to make adjustments in the areas of our lives that are hindering us from costly participation in the mission of the church. Not because he wants to take anything away from us, but because he wants to because but because he wants to give us more in Christ, more joy in Christ. For the sake of greater satisfaction in Jesus, let's stop orienting his church to our lives and begin orienting our lives to his church when that happens we'll no longer be treating the church like a commodity that is subject to our convenience 
Instead, we'll be delighting in it as the precious bride for which Jesus Christ laid down his life for. Paul wrote, men, love your wives the way Jesus loved his church. The Bible is very clear about Jesus' love for the bride of Christ, the church. People can say, well, you know, the church is in my living room. The church is in my garage. The church is at the park with a couple of believers there. Uh, Absolutely, yes, it is. And the church is here too. The church is in a boat where two people meet in the the middle of a lake in in North Korea due to persecution. The church, which I posted this morning, the church, which I posted this morning in a news article, we find where it says that Christians in Qatar are converting to Christianity, but it means losing family members. It means losing a stand in society. But for the sake of Jesus, they're coming together in secrecy to worship and service. That's the church. We don't have that persecution. Uh, Monday night adult Bible study. No persecution to stop you from coming here. Tuesday night prayer meeting. No, we're getting ready to go to Wednesday night prayer meeting. We don't have no persecution in America to stop us from coming to pray. Friday night classes for all ages. Sunday mornings. No, no, but, but, but what do we put in our way to say, oh, I can't make it? Well, you know what I was taught from an early age in Christianity? You don't go to church to get something. You go to church to give something. I was reminded of that fact when I went to Waco last week. And, and it does, we, we enter to worship, leave to serve. That gripped on and I. It was on the, over the head of a little church we saw. Enter to worship, leave to serve. You know, when, when, a, when, a, when a war is going on and, and the, the troops, they always got to gather with the other troops to get their battle plans together, to get motivated, to get morale back up, to get, to, to get supplies. And then they go back out and fight. How is that any different from the church when we gather together like this? Whether it be a Friday, whether it be a Wednesday night prayer or a Monday night Bible study. And then we wonder why Christians are, are walking away from the faith. We wonder why we're going through what we're going through when we don't give God the time of day or the body of Christ time of day. We, 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 look, at the, we look at the failures of the church and think that that's connected to God. We look at the failures of a pastor. We look at the failures of all that. Oh, that whatever. Well, you know what? I'll, I'll tell you what right now. Who, we read about Peter, who was a great man of God, but yet Peter denied Christ three times. He denied him three times. We think something about these men who walked with Jesus. They all scattered and left them alone. But yet, Jesus saw their failure. He blessed them. He's redeemed them. And they went out and, and they did some of the greatest things human eyes have ever seen. And that was what? Write the gospel of Jesus Christ. Get your eyes off of people and get your eyes on Jesus. And then you'll have a whole new appreciation for the church. Some of you have been coming to the church for a long time and you're dead in your faith. You may be watching online. You may be in this room. And it's time to stir up. Let the Holy Spirit stir up in you. You used to give, give, give. Now you don't give anymore. You know, uh, we, we don't come to the body of Christ to be takers, but to be givers. Because when Jesus came, what did Jesus say? I come to serve, not to be served. That's scripture. That's what Jesus said. That way, when we get to heaven... And I've talked about it here recently. When those pearly gates open and you see what the word, the, what does the word say? No eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has prepared for those who love him. It's been taking Jesus 2,000 years to build what he has for his believers. The Bible says that God created the world in six days. But yet it's taken Jesus 2,000 years to create what he has for the church. This is going to far outweigh what he first created. And that's why it does cost something. It does cost something to enter into the kingdom of God. Yes, salvation has been paid for, but it does cost us something. 
Let the Holy Spirit stir in you. Stop looking at the failures and the chaos and the depression and the darkness that's happening today and get with Jesus. Get with it. Stop making excuses and start praising God. You have not because you ask not. Ask and you shall receive. Some of us can't even stand in this church while the music's going and praise our hand, raise our hand, praise God, praise God. Hallelujah. Why? Because it's not real for you. You don't know Jesus. But what about if you're in heaven and you see him? The Bible says in the book of Revelation that multitudes of angels worship before the Lord day and night. Praising, singing. It's loud in heaven, by the way. It's not quiet in heaven. There is shouts of joy going on in heaven consistently. That's why when the seventh seal is opened, the Bible says there was silence in heaven for 30 minutes. That's the first time silence has ever been recorded in heaven. We're going to praise him because the people of God, they see him. They know how to worship God. They know how to move the mountains that are before them. But, but I see so much potential in this room, but yet you've got to see it for yourself. And you got to say, Lord, I'm tired of being tired. I don't care what this person's doing. I don't care what that person's doing. I want to see the glory of the Lord. Just because the Lord don't answer your prayers doesn't mean that God don't exist or God don't love you or God don't hear you. There is a greater work happening right now. Let the Holy Spirit stir you because I'm going to tell you right now, I've been hearing it for years and years, Jesus is coming soon, Jesus is coming soon. But I tell you what, I studied the word of God and I talked to Jesus and what I have seen lately, I can really tell you, Jesus is coming soon. He's coming real soon. And I'm going to tell you what, a lot of people that were in church ain't going to be there in heaven. Because had I died, I don't think I would have made it. But I praise God for his grace and mercy. And I'm telling you, you better get serious because the devil's serious. And God is serious. And so we're on God's side. God is for us who dare be against us. Get with it. You know, there's some kids back there. They're hearing things about Jesus for the first time. And the devil wants them. I hear, they, they tell me, some of these kids don't want to be here. Why? Because that comes from the family. Love them. Tell them the truth about Jesus. They, they, they believe more in the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus and the trick-or-treating and Halloween than they do in Jesus Christ. Why? Because parents are lying to them. Tell them the truth. Tell them about Jesus. Because if not, somebody else is going to tell them a lie about Jesus. They're going to grow up and say, Mommy, Dad, you told me Santa Claus was, was, was real. Santa Claus is fake. They're not going to believe what you say then. Even I, as an unbeliever, never went trick-or-treating with my kids because even I knew then that was stupid. It was ridiculous. Now, parents, Christian parents, oh, you can't say that. You want to be a part of the ways of the world? Go right on ahead. The road to hell is wide and many shall find it. That's what Jesus said. Michael, you're speaking hate speech. No, I'm not. I'm speaking truth. Truth offends those who are against truth. Hey, you only get one shot at heaven and one shot at hell. Choose. Jesus paid way too high a price for me to just live a mediocre life. Jesus paid way too high a price. I take it personally what Jesus did for me. And I cry my heart out every day. Every day I cry my heart out. I say, I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I've done. But today's the day. Today's the day. Allow the Holy Spirit to stir in you today. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters who are watching online as well. Lord, I pray, Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will begin to stir in the hearts. I thank you for Pastor Eric's word, Lord. I thank you, Father, for what you've given to him. And Lord, how this this whole morning is, is complete because of what you do. Not what men do, but what you do. And Lord, I pray that there is a stirring in our hearts that we would commit to our home local church, whether it be this church or that church, it don't matter, it's the church. Lord, that there would be a stirring. I thank you, Father. Lord, I pray for healing. 
I pray for, Lord, I pray for this ministry. You know the needs we have here, Father. You know the, the desire that you put on my heart, Lord, to see kids come to this school and may this school be filled with kids who are receiving the love of Christ. Lord, we have 10 kids here. That's, that's symbolic for a time of testing. Lord, I, I pray, Lord, that you would bring more children here, that this school wouldn't close down, Lord. There's a public school here, Lord, with thousands of kids, Lord, and, and what are they really learning? Here we are, Lord. Here we are, Lord. I, I, I bought this bus, Lord, because you told me to buy it. I'm ready to, for kids to come to this school to, to learn, to grow, to be kept safe from the hand of the enemy. Well, I ask you for help, Holy Spirit. I'm not here to make any money, Lord. You know my heart. But Lord, we need help. It's your people that decide that, Lord. And Lord, I, I, as I say it, Lord, may it go out into the spiritual realm of this city. Bring workers, Lord. Bring men, women of God who have been searching for a place to serve to make a difference in people's lives. Help us, Lord. We ask for your help, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. In the name of Jesus.